Welcome to the Doctor's Mentor Show. If you believe that medicine is an industry and not a profession, if you enjoy submitting complex reimbursement claims, or you would do another residency just for fun, be advised, you're about to be offended. You should probably leave now. All this talk about mentoring doctors is ridiculous. I thought doctors learned to do everything better than everyone else the first year of medical school. At least that's the way they act. If you love assisting patients with vitality breakthroughs, if the right to practice medicine without interference is important, and you want expert tips for practice freedom and profits to support your epic life, welcome aboard and prepare to be blown away. The Doctor's Mentor Show starts now. Here's your host, Dr. Lori Barr. Hi, I'm Dr. Lori Barr. Thanks for joining us for the show. So excited to bring you the second half of my interview with Dr. David Nichols. If you'll recall, the last time we heard from Dave, we were talking about how he had this amazing love life with the love of his life and the legacy they built together because they are champions. Today's topic. That's very, very close to a medal. So I, that's the best I ever did. And I'm proud of it. I'm real proud of that. Now I'm so what do you, what's the out. legacy of that? I mean, how many people do you think you and Kay have influenced to take skiing and enjoy it and be competitive? At this moment today, yesterday, today, and tomorrow, they're having a water ski clinic for kids just south of Austin in San Marcos, Texas. It's called the K. Nichols You Can Do It Clinic for Kids. I'm real proud of that. There's a, there's a huge, she has a huge, huge following. And there's more to it than that, too. But I don't know how to answer that. There's people that she knows that I don't know. Mm-hmm. Lots and yeah. lots. So between the two of you, though, that's, that's a huge legacy in your life. And did ARA, did working at ARA help? You build legacy like that or hurt Hurt. in building? Hurt. Okay. Explain. Work all the time. No time no time for me to get there and participate and do it very much. I would have loved to participate more. But maybe it helped too because it paid for it. Right. (laughs) So it paid for it and gave us the money to do that lifestyle. That's very important too. And actually I did get something very good out of it too. Um I'm a water ski driver. I've been driving for more than 30 years, water skiing. And this summer, I get to drive a tournament almost every weekend, all summer long, all around the country. I, I, part of that is I chief drive the Texas State Championships. I'm going to chief drive the regionals. I'm going to drive the water ski nationals in Idaho. And I'm going to drive the college world championships in Japan. I'm doing all that this summer. And I'm really proud of that. That's awesome. Really proud. That is like a huge accomplishment. That's my first world championship drive. <laughs> I hope I get more. So it should be fun. So obviously you're retired. I and you, just retired. And and what what did you what do you know now about retirement that you wish you'd have known before you turned in your letter saying you were going to retire? I wish I'd known to do it sooner. <laughs> I'm serious about that. Um, you can, it seems like it'll work. It seems like everything is fine. I was probably worried about nothing. Uh, I wished I had known some more things about where the money's going to come from and how much and, and what are going to be the tax ramifications and the burden on that, you know, fees for manage this, manage that. I wished I had known more about it. And if I had known more about it, I think I would have been able, I'm guessing, to retire several years earlier. And I would have done that. And I would have spent more time doing some things. I mean, I want to, I love being a radiologist. I love what I know about radiology, but I would have softened the load sooner. So if I had known the right so that's, the things that I know now. That's a real deficit in physician learning. Is it's phys- a deficit. Physicians definitely don't learn enough about finances for business or personal, and they're known. Like for anybody who's listening, who's a financial advisor, just realize that 
doctors in general, if they, if you gain their confidence, they will keep you as a financial advisor their whole life. The first one. That's true. So that oh, I was with my financial advisor like ten minutes before I came over here. I want to emphasize to people is you got to take time away from. It's easy to be in the grind of working because you're good at it and it feels good to do what you're good at. Learning about finances doesn't feel good because you don't do it all the time. So how do you do that? Well, the the interesting thing I was thinking of a second ago is I knew retirement was coming up, so I tried to ask the questions. I called the human resources people all the time, talked to them at I called our financial advisors and talked to them all the time. I talked to my stockbrokers and nobody would answer the questions. They they just they I don't think people know what social security is. I don't think they know how we have a buy-in and a buy-out situation so we can own this business, big business, and there's complexity to that buyout. Nobody knows the answers. Did you think about reaching out to other people who had already retired from ARA? I tried that too, and they had simple questions like, it's all there. <laughs> <laughs> It'll work. It's good. I mean, and all, all of them said if they'd have known how it was going to go, they would have taken more time off and they would have retired sooner. They all said that. Our workload is huge yeah. and and anything to do to soften that burden is good. So do you think, so what were you afraid of facing retirement? I wouldn't have enough money. Because money, money, money is a, I mean, people go into radiology for lifestyle. I mean, that's a known fact mm -hmm. that, you know, the people in the medical school class who dra gravitate toward radiology usually are people who enjoy sports. They usually like to drive fast cars. They usually look nice and they're in great shape. Just saying. Yep. <laughs> so. and, and as a radiologist, you'll sit in a chair for 11 hours per day and get fat. Um, and? And you still have to find time for yourself to work out, do things you like and love, other things that you like and love. And it's hard to do all that, but you have to find the time or make the time. How did you make the time to be such a good dad? Because, you know, you're, you and Kay are both great parents. So how did that, how'd you find time for that? I probably delegated that responsibility to my wife. <laughs> no, I, I have been told, I mean, I, I consider that I was the dad that wasn't there enough, should have been there more. But I was literally always there if I was not at work. Because if we were ever at the lake, they were always with us too. Every trip we ever did, everything in our lives, we it was four of us. We were all there all the time. And so, I, I mean, they told me that I was a great dad, even though I perceived myself as having to have to work too much. I, I guess I did some things right. I, I don't know what it is. Well, just to give you an example, and the reason I'm wearing this turtle sweater, if you're watching the video, you can see there are turtles all over the sweater, is um, <laughs> when I first moved here, I wasn't sure it was going to work out. Even though David told me how the group was going to work and everybody else had to, I wasn't sure that I was going to make partner. So Steve, my husband, stayed behind in Ohio, and I moved down to Austin with our four-year-old by myself. Single parenthood is not all it's cracked up to be especially if you don't know anybody in town. Well, how did it come about that you decided on those turtles for Richard? Do you remember? I know exactly. He had a project in Boy Scouts or Cub Scouts or something. He needed a pet. Oh, that's right. He needed so a he pet needed a so Cub he could Scout have some pet. responsibility so he could take care of this pet. And lazy as I am, a turtle is not that hard to take care of. And I thought, I thought, well, how could you be mad? <laughs> For, and I brought these turtles from Clark Lake, Michigan. Right. On an airplane Four in my hand. turtles in an airplane in his hands for my son <laughs> to have a Cub Scout project. And now there's turtles all over Barton Creek. No, 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 Lake no. Austin. They're actually in Alabama. Are they in we Alabama? Took them, we took oh. them to Alabama and released them at the community I pond. I love it. I love so it. So they're that's where they are. We that's would great. go and see them, you know, and everything, and it's been great. Yeah. But you know, that's why I'm wearing the turtles. Is that's just good. a reminder. I that, live on Tortuga Trail. Do you? Tortuga is turtle in Spanish. That kind of heart, 
um, that kind of caring for individuals. Did how did you not lose that? You know, a lot of people say that doctors are heartless and that they're callous and that they have no emotions. And obviously, you didn't lose any of that. You've had passion for your sports, passion for your family, passion for life. How did you not? How did you avoid becoming calloused the way doctors are perceived to be callous? I don't know the real answer to that, but I know that when I reading 500 cases or films a day <clears throat> that's that and it's boring but when you have to get up out of that chair and go talk to a patient over there about something or this or that move their arm around or feel their neck or do something that that was pleasure for me because the patient liked it um, it's funny I went into radiology because I didn't like patients but when I found out all my dealings with patients were positive, I enjoyed it and did a lot of it. And I always considered it, I mean, I, I take it as a, I mean, I would always do it so I could make the case and the interpretation better, but I also considered it an honor. It was my distinct honor to talk, see, touch the patient and figure it out. And it just, I, I don't know. It, it, I got something out of it. I, it wasn't that I, why didn't I ever lose it or some other doctors lose it. I never lost it because it was, I was honored. I was honored by it. You, it sounds to me like you honor life. You know, you respect Absolutely. life and honor life. And you celebrate when you have the opportunity to have a moment that's alive. I mean, you, you, that moment means something to you when it's with another it's totally person. Totally true. So. My friends will call me in the middle of the night and ask me a medical, medical question, and every single one of them will tell you that I spend all the time necessary to help them get through whatever incident or problem they had, and the reason is the same thing. One of my friends needs some help, and I always considered it an honor. And then ne no, I tried never, ever, ever to let anyone know that I was in a rush, I didn't have time for them, it was not going to get full. I, I always thought my duty was to give them my full attention while I'm there and make it seem like it was thorough and good and correct, whether that's true or not. I mean, that was what I that was your intention. wanted to happen. Yeah. yeah. So you decided on your outcome before you engaged with the patient or with a referring physician, and you gave them your full attention. And you gave it your right. best in the moment. And then you applied the clinical encounter to your interpretation of the images and followed up with a report that was absolutely flawless because you're a perfectionist. Absolutely flawless. <laughs> Hopefully that was, that was the goal. Right. So because he set the outcome, it's really important to set your outcome right before you do stuff so that you get what you want instead of just willy-nilly walking through life like in competition don't you set the outcome to win or oh, to yeah. perform every time every time i won i knew i was going to win before i won yeah. every single time i forgot to tell you i was sponsored by la point o'brien for three years oh, really? too. yeah i got free stuff free skis vests everything and and i used to keep records and one summer i won like 14 tournaments wow that's amazing and every single time. So I did win some. And, you know, I'd consider myself the big loser because time marches on and weight marches on and you get old and decrepit. But every time I won a tournament, I knew before I got on the water I was going to win it. Every time. There's no doubt. If I go out there with doubt, doubt. doesn't work. And it's the same. Doubt, doubt is bad. It's the same with a patient encounter. Yeah. Every patient's different. You go in the room with the confidence to see your patient. Regardless of whether you've seen something exactly like that mm -hmm. before, your confidence, patients borrow your confidence to feel better. That's important to them. And they know it. They know it from the way you touch their body. They know it from the way you look at them, the way you speak to them, the way you smile. They know if you're confident or not. They can feel it. You can fake it, but they're going to feel the truth. There's When I started in radiology, I 
tried to fake that I knew all about what I was doing here, but in reality, you'll never know it all. You'll never be the best in the world. You, There's things that come up and you just don't know. And I learned really, really early to just fess, fess up. I don't know. I don't know that this is a shoulder and I don't know there's four tendons that come around and hold that together. I don't know there's a labrum that goes around it. I don't know. I mean, whatever it is you don't know, it's okay. But they need to know you can help them find out. Whatever the issue is, I can help you find out who that guy is that does know this. And we can get this handled. I know we're going to be able to do that. And I know who that guy is. And if I don't know who that guy is, I know how to find that guy. So you go in there in the room with that confidence, even though you'll never know it all, and you might not know what you're going to confront, you know you're going to have a plan. And that plan sometimes takes a week to find out. You know, if you want to send to the best pancreatic oncologist in the world, you know, it may take you a few days to find that out, get the appointment and do things like that, but you can do it. If, if you look at obstacles or challenges you've faced in your life and you look at ones that happen within the profession and those that happened outside of the profession, which has more intensity? Which was harder to overcome or which did you learn the most from? Well, I definitely learned the most from the work challenges. But the work challenges were always known. It was, we're going to do a new procedure or do a new thing like, hey, we're going to add MRI or we're going to do some, you know, anything new. You have to learn how to do it. That's a challenge. You have to do it. You have to be overcome the fear of the first one you do. And you have to come overcome those things lots in radiology. There's every day of my life, there's something that I didn't know or hadn't done or hadn't seen or didn't know anything about. So it happens a lot. It's not just casual. Those were challenges. But I learned to challenge myself. I learned to thrive from the, I learned, I got life from those challenges. I, it stimulated me. And I, it's not an addiction, but it's almost like an addiction. You love that. That's what you go home and tell your wife about. Honey, I got to do this, or I got to see this today or something. They don't know what you saw, did, or whatever. And, you know, you want to show it to your partners because they kind of have an idea. But those are challenges. Some of those were hard, but totally, totally rewarding, every single one of them. They're fabulous. I got to learn to love that, too. And, you know, when the first day I walked in the door as a radiologist, I was scared out of my mind. I, fear is one of my great Fears. Does that make sense? <laughs> <laughs> well, fear, fear immobilizes people. What are you afraid of most? What am I afraid of most? That I won't accomplish the task correctly. But looking back on my life, I basically have always accomplished that task. And I'm really proud of that. But fear, fear doesn't immobilize me. Fear puts me in the position of okay, I'm going to totally focus. So I'm going to walk through every step of it before I encounter it. I'm going to read everything I can about it. I'm going to memorize it. I might take notes. I might have the book right beside me or the article over here. And I'll have all the information I can get when I confront that challenge. And it it's delightful. And you go in and you do it, it happens totally normal. And you feel so good about it. So it sounds to me like you just said that fear is a... Mobilizes is, me. It, it turns on your switch to say, hey, I'm encountering something new. This is the process I use when I encounter something new in the professional setting as a radiologist. Where do you think that figuring out a process for when you're fearful, where'd that come from? Did you do that as a child hunting on the ranch or did you do that water skiing or did you do that as you learned in medical school to study? Where do you think that came from? It might have come from ARA. It might have come from the job. I don't think I had that as a kid, but I did accomplish lots of things as a kid, but it didn't ever come to my awareness maybe until I got to a higher level of fear or, <laughs> right. or, nece or necessary <laughs> expertise or something. But I probably learned 
in the job that no matter how hard or difficult or high or whatever, you will be able to handle it and get it done. I've probably learned that in ARA because okay. just because every day there was something yeah, you something had to think different. about. Mm-hmm. You had to think about something every single day that where did this come from? What's this? What? <laughs> so, so now you're in retirement. We're not all the experts you think we are. <laughs> are. Are you still thinking about something every day? I mean, that's a big switch to go from where there's an intellectual challenge every single day to retirement is a big switch that many radiologists don't handle well at all. So how have you shifted that so your intellectual curiosity is satisfied elsewhere? The, within the first two weeks of retirement, I went to a CME course <laughs> and learned some more medicine. <laughs> I did that, and that was very rewarding. Uh, it was fun, very rewarding, and I don't intend to do a lot of that, but it was fun, and that is challenging. And all of These tournaments I'm driving are fun and challenging. My ranch is fun and challenging. Those are kind of the big things. My family is fun and challenging. Um, and I'll, you know, the time I've got, I will be devoting to those things. And, and you've, you know, you've, I mean, I don't know that. And, and, and part of the transition is the work I have to do. There's a lot of work you have to do when you retire. You have to move this account here and that account there and put it in this way instead of that way. And there's, a, a bunch of there's stuff. tasks. There are tasks, and my time is. I'm so busy now that I don't have time. I don't. I don't know how I ever had time to work. Well, that, so I don't I, have to think about how do I transition. Okay. I don't have time to even think, think about, about that. Okay. All yeah. right. Well, that makes sense. Let me ask you about uh, volunteerism as a professional. Now, you served uh, in the Travis County Medical Society. You remember? Were you an officer of Travis County Medical Society? No. Um, but you were a delegate for Texas Medical Association to the AMA, and then you were appointed by Governor Perry for a long term on the Texas Radiation Advisory Board. Correct. Like a long time, 2009 to 2016. That's a huge amount of time. What? How did Doctor? How Should did have said 2015? But yeah, it's a six <laughs> six year term. So how did Governor Perry? know about you and how did how did you make all that happen and and what did you what was the legacy of that what did you learn from it well it happened maybe because the night the first no the second george bush the second george bush had the election the night of the presidential election where george ii was elected i was in Westwood Country Club working out with Rick Perry all night. I mean, 45 minutes on the bicycle side by side, plus a few other weights and things. We were working out and on the bicycle, I got to know him fairly well for a short period of time. And I guess I didn't have any contact with him after that, but his right-hand man, which is a girl named Teresa Spears and a good friend of mine, might have kept it alive because I think knowing him and we did talk about medicine and insurance payments and things like that on the night he was becoming governor, essentially. Exactly. I was there. So he associated you with a very positive memory. Maybe. I'm, mm-hmm. I'm hoping. I'm hoping that's how it happened. Um, so I got the appointment. They asked me if I would do it. it. It's funny. It came to me. They said, hey, Dave, Governor Perry um, wants you to be a member of Texas Radiation Advisory Board. And I go... He wants me to be. Well, so how many candidates are up for that? They say, Dave, he wants you to do it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> so what did what did you do on that board? That that is a committee that is in charge of all the radiation in Texas. Every every piece of it, from the radiation that comes out of the exit sign at Walmart to the wow. nuclear bomb. And nuclear reactors, every piece of mining, transporting, handling radiation, uh, measuring, calibrating, everything possible about radiation. And it was very interesting. When I started is when about a year after I started was when the Fukushima disaster happened in Japan. 
and we got the Atomic Energy Commission to come in and give us an hour-long lecture with slides and everything on what, where, why, how, and I didn't know that much about radiation. It, it <laughs> they was, didn't teach you that it much was in your residency. Fabulous! Huh? <laughs> it was a learning experience, and but I got to be responsible for you know writing some laws, and one law in particular was the tattoo laser removal law, and I'm. I put some verbiage in that law and turned it into the actual state law. It's where it's the two inch rule. If you have a tattoo on your arm, you want a laser to remove it. We and our committee wrote this law, but there weren't very many MDs on the committee. So they were, they started out that they were going to let you remove a whole body tattoo and that could cause some dermatitis and bad, bad things. So we decided it would be smart to keep is these are non-physicians removing these things. Okay. They don't know what a complication might be. So the way we handled that law, and I did this, wrote into the law that the biggest patch you can remove at any one time is a two-by-two two square. Hmm. And so that's one example of what we did. But we wrote many other laws. We talked, you know, there's 100 people in the room. We'd talk about it, discuss it. What's your favorite thing about having had a successful career? I mean, what did it allow you to do that you wouldn't have gotten to do otherwise? Well, my lifestyle. I mean, I got my lifestyle because of the career. And that's fabulous and good. I learned an insurmountable amount of knowledge. I mean, I just, I'm really proud of the knowledge that came from this. You came to the group with that knowledge. Really. I learned that yeah. after after I got to the group. Oh, I guarantee you I've learned <laughs> much more practicing with ARA than I ever did in academics. <laughs> I'm really proud of that knowledge, and I'm glad I got that. And I'm also glad I got through the career. I mean, I feel like I got through it unscathed. I mean, there were some bumps in the road here and there, but, you know, I'm proud of the fact that it happened. Quietly, you've done things to help people who couldn't help themselves people that you knew, like maybe it would be a tech at work or somebody who had a family tragedy and maybe they couldn't afford a funeral for somebody and all of a sudden you and Kay just, boom, did it. That that ability to freely give, where did that come from? Because most doctors are pretty stingy with contributions and you guys just give and not not looking always for the tax deductible deduction, you know, write-offs or anything. Right. You you just give. Where did that come from? I mean, is that something y'all sat down as a couple and said, this is important to us? Or is this something you saw in your parents? They always helped out? Or? No, I no, it, it, it probably has more to do with the need. If we perceived a need somewhere, it was always it's good to help fix that, whatever that need is. So you, if you saw something where you thought you could make a difference, you just did it. Right. And you just made a and, habit of it. And I don't know where it came from or why, but yeah, we've got that. Were you a Boy Scout? I was. Were you I, an Eagle Scout? I was. Well, there it's where it came from. <laughs> so, <laughs> just saying. <laughs> so. I, went, I went to the World Jamboree. I got, I don't know if I told Richard this. I need, that's Richard is her son. He was an Eagle Scout and I'm very proud of him for doing that. And some other accomplishments he's had, he's really going down the right line. Um, I want to show him, I've never shown him a patch collection in my palms. He needs to see that. You guys should go to a World Jamboree together as adults and trade patches with people. I don't know if he, well, I traded patches. Uh, did he trade patches? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. He's got a huge collection. Well, you you guys should get together and That's, compare. Yeah. <laughs> I want to show him. So if there's one thing that you want to make sure that physicians who are just starting their career or thinking about medicine or maybe they're in the first few years out of practice, there's one thing you would tell them right off the bat that, you know, just no matter what happens, don't forget this. What would that be? It's a patient. It's not a number. It's not the gallbladder in room three. It's a patient, and you love that patient. So love, love humans. You, yeah, you got to love medicine. You got to love the patient. You got to love the fact that you're going to help them get well. Um, those are the things you got to have. If you don't have that, don't go into medicine. 
don't go into medicine for the money. It gave me a fabulous lifestyle. I'm very thankful for that, but you can make more money somewhere else. Don't go into medicine for the love of the medicine, the love of how you're going to help that patient get well, and the love you'll feel between you and that patient when things do turn out well, and they will. It's very rewarding. And then my last question for you um, is... When you look at the time that you spent with Kay when she got ill and her declining illness, was there anything that you did to kind of strengthen yourself so that you didn't get sick too or you didn't get down? How'd you keep your energy up? Because that's most caregivers. They suffer from depression. They get sick themselves. I mean, I have a, a relative who died taking care of his wife. You know, just went out and sat in the car and got pneumonia and died uh, because it was too much, and he didn't. He wasn't taking care of himself. He was so focused on her. So, how do you? How did you not fall into that trap that many people fall into? I did. I did fall into that trap. I got overweight because I didn't get to exercise and do the things I want to do. Um, I would spend all day at work, which made the money was necessary and then paid for the health insurance. It was very necessary for Kay. And, and then when I'd come home, I was full-time caregiver and I was, I love her and was totally devoted to her. And there was, there was no other option. It, it's, um, I want and needed and had to, the situation demanded that I take care of her. It was my duty to take care of her, and I wanted to. It was never a question. And in that process, I didn't ever get depressed. I got out of shape because I wasn't getting to do things. But we never, we never stopped our lifestyle. We continued our lifestyle as is and like it always was. Um, and do you the, think that her being in really great shape? made that easier to maintain your lifestyle? It helped. It helped a lot. Um, the last day of Kay's life, I carried her like this out on the dock where eight friends were having lunch and set her down in a chaise lounge. And she was a little too tired just for that. So I picked her up and I carried her in a little closet that was cool and it was hot summertime cool and dark and a little fan in it and she was more comfortable in there and when lunch was done i carried her back out to the people to say goodbye and um she loved it she had a smile on her face and she died that night about five or six hours later but we lived every minute we had we continued doing exactly what we would have done no matter what. So is that... And so we, and it's not like we weren't focused on the disease and what's going on. We did everything we could for the, for and against the disease and the problem to handle it. But we remained 100% focused on our lives. We, our motto has always been live the minute you have now. Okay. That's, that's definitely Live the minute you have now. Saying. It's been our yeah. motto. Because that's the only one you know you have. My so mother many, went over like this. And so many people just like go through the motions. They don't even notice yeah. that they're living that moment. Yeah, so. appreciate what you've got and enjoy that minute. And be grateful. Yeah, appreciation is everything. <laughs> so, well, speaking about being grateful, I'm so grateful that you were able to spend time talking about all these things, about changes in life, changes in love, changes in everything about life that happens when you lose someone you love and then also when you transition from a very rewarding career into a very active retirement. So thank you. Well, you're very welcome. I hope I didn't mess it up too bad. <laughs> it's been my distinct honor to be here and I enjoyed it. Thanks for asking me. You're welcome. Your next step. I hope you enjoyed the second half of the interview with David as much as I did. You know, every single one of us has the ability to 
infuse more passion into now. The question is, are you aware of your current state and can you bring it up? Can you smile more? Can you control your energy? If you need help with that, keep listening to the show. There's more to explore at thedoctorsmentor.com. Are you stopping at a hospital? Hello? Don't you know that hospitals are one of the sickest places on the planet? Don't touch anything in there and get out as fast as you can. 